Help support Name Explain by liking this video, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. As humans, we love to name things. I've said this many times on the channel, but seriously, there's little we won't give names. Our nations, our cities, our children, our animals, our homes, our cars, our... Well, some people do that anyway. You get the idea. There's pretty much nothing on the planet that doesn't have a name. In fact, I feel confident saying that everything we know of on planet Earth does have a name. Though I'm happy to be wrong, so let me know if you can think of something that doesn't have a name. So, what do we do when we have nothing left on Earth to name? It's simple really, we look up. The skies around us are full of interesting things we can give names. From clouds and the sun in daytime, to the stars that light up the night sky. However, one of the most intriguing things that we humans have pondered over for millenniums is that big boy of cheese that can be seen across the globe. The moon. A moon is a natural satellite that orbits a larger planet. Most of the planets in our solar system have moons, all with interesting names. Our moon however is just called the moon. This is something we've actually looked into in a video unto itself about why exactly our moon is just called the moon, while other moons have much more interesting names. Today however we aren't looking into the name for our moon as a whole, but rather the names we have given to various parts of the moon and its features like mountains and valleys and quote unquote water features. And the issue with this is, well, well, it's kind of a mess. The history of naming parts of the moon dates back to the invention of the telescope. Different people giving parts of the moon a variety of different names, then other people once these initial names have died spent their time trying to sort out the mess these astronomers of the past made. So this is the messy history of naming parts of the moon. As I said, this all started with the invention of the telescope. We aren't too sure on the exact time that the telescope was created or the person who did it, but it's thought that glass making skills improved greatly in the 1500s, and by 1608 we had a Dutch eyeglass maker called Hans Lippersche who claimed to have made a device that could magnify objects to three times, though at the time this was hotly debated as another eyeglass maker from the same town by the name of Zacharias Janssen claimed that Hans stole his idea. We don't really know for sure who invented this telescope, but history seems to have dubbed Hans Lippersche as the main inventor of the telescope. And while this invention was impressive, three times magnification wasn't too much, especially in regards to seeing things floating in space. This is where Galileo comes into the story. By 1609 he had heard of these Dutch perspectives glasses as they had been dubbed. He wanted to try one but was unable to get his hands on one. So instead of paying ludicrous 17th century postage fees, he simply built his own one, without even seeing or holding one of the Dutch ones. Not only did he successfully build one, but his telescope could magnify objects up to 20 times, so it's safe to say that Galileo was a pretty smart cookie. He took his new telescope to the Venetian Senate, they loved this so much they set him up as a lecturer for life, doubled his salary, and allowed him to explore the cosmos freely with his new toy. He even went on to spot moons of Jupiter which are now dubbed the Galilean moons of Jupiter, and from here more and more people got their hands on telescopes and set forth exploring and charting the night sky. And of course it was the moon that got a lot of attention in this time. While a lot of the universe was still fairly out of reach with these telescopes, with the moon being so close to us, well comparatively, it made it the thing everyone was observing. Galileo himself was the first to spot craters and mountains on the moon, however it didn't seem that he named any of these lunar features himself. Other astronomers took on this challenge themselves in something I like to dub the race to name the moon, which is what I might call this video, I'm not sure yet. Let me know if I did. This led to the creation of the study of selenography. This is the study of the surface of the moon and its physical features. It would be easy to call this moon geography as that is what it kind of is, however to call this geography really isn't accurate at all. The word geography is Greek and means earth writing, coming from geo meaning earth and glaphos meaning writing. So considering the moon isn't earth, it really isn't accurate to use the word geography. So the name selenography was created, with the selene part coming from the name of the Greek goddess of the moon, Selene. It seems that the first key figure to come up in lunar nomenclature is Dutch astronomer Michael van Langren in 1645. As a devout Catholic, he gave the major features of the moon names of Catholic royalty and saints. He also gave the seas of the moon Latin names. Now, I should probably mention what these seas of the moon actually are, or as they are more commonly known as the Maria of the moon, which is the plural of mer, the Latin word for sea. These Maria aren't seas like we have here on earth, but were thought to be in water on the moon to begin with. They are actually just dark plains of lower elevation on the moon which astronomers of the past mistook for water. Langren also named smaller craters and features after astronomers, mathematicians and other scholars from his past, and important scholars of his time. By 1647, two years after Langren's map was published, another astronomer by the name of Johannes Hervelius released his map of the topography of the moon. Wikipedia even dubs him the founder of lunar topography, but as we just saw, someone named parts of the moon before him. While his map was similar to the map of Langren's, there was a noticeable difference. Hervelius had ditched the names that Langren had put on his 
his map of the moon. It appears that Hevelius was Lutheran, so that could most likely be the reason why he wanted to remove the names of people of importance in Catholicism from the face of the moon. He instead named features of the moon after things that were similar to them here on earth, so mountain ranges on the moon were named after mountain ranges here on earth and so on. However, he used their Latin names, in my guess to make them seem more fancy. People loved making things seem fancy in the past. Lunar mappers like Johann Schlotter and Johann Madler too made maps of the moon, with once again different names attached to different features of the moon. However, However, it seems that the person who made the biggest shockwaves in lunar nomenclature was Italian astronomer Giovanni Riccioli. His map, which he worked on with colleague Francesco Glimaldi, was much more extensive. They broke the moon into eight zones and introduced a much more systematic way to name features of the moon, which encompassed previous ways others had named parts of the moon. He named craters after popular scholars like Langren did, and even as a gesture to the Catholic Church, which he was a part of, named some craters after saints too. However, he only named them after saints that had relation to astronomy. Astronomy, unlike Langren, who named them after any old saint. However, his most interesting mark on the moon is what he named the seas of the moon. He gave them unique descriptive names. I couldn't figure out why exactly, but nevertheless it gave us pretty names like the Sea of Tranquility, Sea of Nectar, and more gloomy names like Sea of Crisis and Sea of Cold. All of these different maps of the moon with all these different names for features of the moon meant things got a little messy and confusing when it came to talking about the moon. Different people knew parts of the moon by different names, so when it came to discussing the moon with others in a professional or academic sense, it got really confusing. Imagine if we had this issue with our planet, if there were different maps with different names for our nations on them. And I'm not talking about exonyms and endonyms here, I mean if on one map Germany was called Bob, but on another map it was called Harry, and on another map it was called Jeff. And parts of the world used the Bob map, parts used the Harry map, and others used the Jeff map. Imagine how confusing United Nation meetings and things like that would get, especially in a time before the internet where you couldn't just google the fact that the country you call Bob is known as Harry or Jeff to others. This is the issue people who spent their working life studying the moon came against. And this confusing and messy state of lunar topography came to a breaking point in 1905. It was this year that British astronomer Samuel Arthur Adams became so unhappy with the state of affairs of names on the moon that he alerted the International Association of Academies, an academy with the intention of linking various academies around the world. They realised that this was an issue too, so in 1907 they set up the Committee of Lunar Nomenclature, which sounds really cool and I'm heartbroken that I wasn't alive at the time to be a part of it. This committee was headed by the aforementioned Samuel Arthur Adams, and he enlisted the help of other astronomers of his time too, most noticeably one by the name of Mary Blagg. It was supposed to be their job to organise, standardise, and formalise the names of features on the moon, in the hope that the entire world would adopt these names for features of the moon, or well, at least in each nation's language of choice anyway. However, you will notice that I use the words supposed to, as while this committee sounds like an awesome concept for lovers of names like myself, it kind of failed. The big issue for this committee was death. It seems that many Many members of the committee died in quick succession, even Samuel Arthur Adams himself died in 1912, and the International Association of Academies itself closed its doors in 1913. However, not all hope was lost as the work Mary Black had done so far on the project was published in 1913. This however still contained issues and discrepancies that needed to be solved. These would stay unsolved till 1919 when the International Astronomical Union was founded, that's the IAU for short. And I just noticed that this association turned 100 years old this year, and the moon landed celebrated its 50th anniversary recently. Let's just call this a happy accident. Anyway, one of the first things the IAU got to work on was finishing the task the Committee of Lunar Nomenclature started 12 years before them, to finally standardise the names of features on the moon. The IAU appointed Mary Blagg once again to help with this as she played a pivotal role in the Committee of Lunar Nomenclature. She was not alone in this of course. The task was chaired by another astronomer named Herbert Hall Turner, and retired Czech government official and amateur astronomer Karl Muller played a big role in this too. Thankfully for this team it seems that a sudden case of multiple people dying at the same time didn't affect them as they were able to finish this task. However, this wasn't a short job by any means. This task started in 1919 and it wasn't until 1935 that the two volume set dubbed Named Lunar Formations, written by Mary Black and Carl Muller was published. The names for lunar features printed in these books were adopted by the IAU and have since become the standard names for features of the moon and are referenced when discussing the subject in any scenario, with updated versions of these books coming out as the years went on with maps and coordinates. Black and Muller even went on to have craters on the moon named after them, for the work they put into formalising the names of features on the moon. The headache that started in the 17th century with astronomers dicking about with telescopes, drawing maps and all giving parts of the moon different names was finally sorted out. So what names did Blagg, Muller and the other astronomers go with in the end? While they seem to have used a mixture of the naming conventions the previous astronomers used, we still see craters named after academics and important Catholics like Langer.
manga named them, with craters like the Incarami Crater, named after Italian astronomer and Catholic priest Giovanni Incarami. Even more modern astronomers and academics have had craters named after them, like the Bade Crater, named after German astronomer Walter Bade, and the Schrödinger Crater, named after physicist Erwin Schrödinger. However, we still have hints of Hevelius's naming convention of naming places on the moon similar to places on Earth. Mountain ranges on the moon include Mont Alps, Mont Jura, and Mont Caucasus, all named after the Alps, Jura, and Caucasus mountains we have here on Earth, respectively. But perhaps best of all, all the crazy names that Giovanni Riccioli gave the seas of the moon have remained intact. Wonderful names like the Sea of Tranquility, Lake of Death, Bay of Rainbows, and Marsh of Decay, just to name a few, are still present on our moon, despite the fact we know there aren't any actual seas, lakes, or marshes on the moon. Nevertheless, these names have stood the test of time, as a reminder of the mess that went into naming the features of the moon. The features of the moon were suggested by Denny Zavada and Kevin Iger, and thanks to their suggestion, they will now be honoured as Name Explains Patreon Saint of the Features of the Moon. Do you have a good idea for someone that's name could be covered in a Name Explained video? If so, then please consider donating on Patreon. Just $1 a month helps keep the channel running and earns you a weekly chance to suggest somewhere to be turned into a video, and you too could be a Name Explained Patreon Saint. Thank you to all my patrons who support Name Explain on a monthly basis. Name Explain depends on small monthly donations from fans like you to help keep the channel running. Just a small amount of $2 a month helps in a huge way, grants you patron exclusive Name Explain extras, and gets your name here with all these awesome people. Thank you.